so good to be here today and to be able to share. And um, as I was saying in our prayer group a little bit earlier, that uh, uh, it's amazing this, uh, this series that we're on, this Hope Restored uh, series. In the last three messages, they've all turned out to be journeys of some form or another. Um, Bruce was telling us about how he threw, threw his kids out the bath water or into pools and, and things in his journey uh, of parenting. And then, of course, Bron spoke about the journey and how a lot of us want to miss the journey because it's, it's not lacquer often and just get the prize. And, uh, and then old, uh, then, sorry, old, young aunt spoke about, spoke about uh, um, being put into situations and when it's tough around you, like things like politics uh, come in and you have to make decisions of are you on the right journey? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually just continue with uh, more or less uh, the same theme, except this journey is a journey in another of our roles in life and, uh, and very appropriate to, to business people. But the words that I'm going to share are going to be words that uh, you can apply to any real role um, that you fulfill uh, in, in life, in the calling that you have. So... Let's go. Let's look at the road that we've taken so far in our Hope Restored series where um, Gary showed us that faith, hope, and love will always be part of our Christian lives. Faith comes from hearing the message of the gospel. Love is an unconditional foundation um, because God will always love you even when you fail. And hope is what connects the foundation of love to the possibility of faith. And Satan knows that he can't change God's love for us or stop us having faith. But what he can do uh, is he can cut that connection of hope. And this is why uh, our hope will be challenged time and time again. This is something that, this is a present from the enemy. Because hope is a key ingredient to live out a love-filled faith life and see the supernatural unlocked in our lives. And I must say that I found my hope challenged many, many times, and uh, especially as, as, as a business person, in my role as a business person. And I suppose, having said what I've just said, it shouldn't be a surprise because we created as image bearers um, to extend Eden. Uh, and Eden is where heaven meets earth. And Satan doesn't like that at all. And our job description is quite clear, and it's given to us in Genesis 1, verse 27. And that is, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And in Matthew 28, we see that we are actually the temple of God. Our mandate is to extend the kingdom into all the world through our vocations. And voc another word for vocations is our callings. So we really don't have any choice in the matter. It's God's will on our lives. But as one takes more responsibility into the kingdom, you seem to come under more attack or I seem to come under more attack, maybe I'm special. We actually, if you think about it, on a journey from Eden to Eden in our roles as Christians in God's kingdom. And Brian spoke so profoundly the other day about the fact that our human condition wants to miss the journey and get the prize. Because sometimes it can be tough and sometimes it can be messy and you know that the prize is there and you feel like going asleep for two years and letting all that mess get cleared up and then take over. But that won't happen. I've been on a roller coaster ride, especially in the last 12 months, uh, as many of you know. And uh, it's so easy to, hose, uh, to, to lose hope and give up in, hope, in, in, in tough times because life is messy, as, as I've just said. Um, we had to restructure our business at the end of last year and remove a cancer that was in the, in, in the business. One of our managers had subtly and progressively started undermining our authority. Um, 
And this happened slowly over time, and the business was being driven to its knees. And uh, you don't see this at, at first, and I never saw it at first. Um, and I suppose, nor did I want to, to believe that this sort of thing could happen. Although there were signs. And I, a person lives in denial. Uh, you, you think, no, this can't be true, and you cover a person's nakedness while he's sticking you in the back. And you can, one can speculate the reasons why this happened, and, uh, but whatever they were, our authority as owners of the business were challenged. Uh, perhaps uh, because we hold a minority shareholding in our company, it was felt that we were irrelevant in the big picture. And certainly the language that we were hearing was, don't listen to them, they don't count anyway. So there was a, an attack on our identity. And I'm sure a lot of you can identify with, with, with those kind of attacks. Our management systems had been neglected and allowed to fall over. <clears throat> we had lots and lots of small, stupid accidents where people would, say, cut a finger or bruise themselves and have to go and get treated and, and, that become, and then become a statistic on our safety record, which is a very important thing in the mining industry. There were no cost controls in place, although we were told there were no safety systems really and no planned maintenance systems. And most of our legal appointments had lapsed and really lip service was being paid to the protocols that were supposed to be in place. And of course, as management, you only get told what they know you want to hear. So our operation was effectively running on chance um, and we were sitting I suggest, on a ticking time bomb. And of course, by the time we realized that uh, there's a problem, something was drastically wrong, and we realized that uh, coalitions had been formed, and uh, lies had become truths to our, adversar our adversaries. And the rot was deep, and it seemed like it was open season on Paul, my business partner, and me. And we became targets of a vicious attack, and when we removed the problem, the hostility intensified. We poked the proverbial bear. So we felt like scapegoats for the anger and bitterness of our major shareholder, especially when we missed our, uh, our business targets. And of course we missed them. Uh, they couldn't be met always because of the sheer neglect of, neglect of the operation. And it took a few months to put the basics back in place, but obviously there was a deep-seated damage and the culture of neglect had to be changed. And you, you, you don't do that overnight. But the on, onslaught intensified. This crediting us and our abilities, we actually felt like Nehemiah must have felt building our inheritance in, on the one hand and uh, fixing up the problems on the other hand um, and fighting for what was ours and what we had started, actually. And we know, knew that we couldn't lose hope and we couldn't give up. <laughs> we didn't have any alternatives. So that's a good motivation. What do you do? You have to go forward. So we had to choose to own and fix our problems. And there they were problems. And I have to say, this was easier said than done. And at the same time, we were fast-tracking a project uh, to give us another feed um, stream of high-grade material. So we were building an extension onto our plant to do this. And so it was, a, it was a real tough time from an operational point of view, and all, also the culture was terrible. You could actually kind of cut the atmosphere when you'd walk onto, onto our plant. And by mid-December, it looked like our operation had started to turn the corner. And I was, of course, in, on holiday, and we were in Mozambique, and Nietzsche in a bikini, and stuff. <laughs> and... Uh, I got an early Christmas present on, on, on New Year's Eve. I got a phone call to tell me that one of our substations was on fire. A circuit breaker had been installed incorrectly, just a circuit breaker. And a qualified um, technician had put the circuit breaker in and it was put in incorrectly. And the substation was on fire. And there and then, two thirds of our production capacity was knocked out. Boom. And of course, I felt hopeless, and I, I said to Nietzsche that uh, this is 
definitely the end of the road for us. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I don't know how we'd ever recover from, from us. And with the hostility around men, uh, it, it's, it, it would be pointed as a management problem and these guys are, are useless and that would just fuel the fire. But God's hand was on us and perhaps because it was kind of a holiday season and there weren't uh, a lot of people around, um, we, carried, we just carried on and we carried on the repairs and completed them by the end of January, a month later. <laughs> and needless to say, we made a record low of production for that month. But what's absolutely amazing is that, uh, that we still generated a profit in the month because the metal price hit a high that we'd never ever seen in our lives before. So we made, uh, we made some money at, at least, notwithstanding the low production. And for, for me that was just a, a total miracle, totally unexpected. And then in February we got over our problems caused by the fire and started commissioning our new circuit. But the attacks of the business seemed to move from the inside to an onslaught from the outside. One community uh, burnt trucks belonging to a company that transports tailings to our plant. Another community marched on our plant and stopped people going in and out um, uh, demanding jobs which we, we didn't have. And uh, they had to be dispersed. And then, of course, at the end of uh, March, we had COVID that knocked us out for a month. And fortunately, it was only for a month. Uh, lots of businesses uh, have been knocked out for lots of months and will never recover, never get back. So thank you, Lord, for that. But when we started up again, we still had maintenance problems. And we were commissioning the new section that we'd uh, uh, just put in place. And there were issues. You don't just press a button and a new section um, uh, produces platinum on the other end just like that. You have to get your operating procedures right. There are a whole lot of bottlenecks that we had to sort out. And uh, consequently, our recoveries were not all that good. And uh, although we were making profits, we weren't hitting our targets. And no one was happy about that. Um, so it was tough. And even before we uh, completed the commissioning of the new circuit, we were getting threats that the feed source would be taken away. It's, it's a high-grade feed source that is, is really, really good and relevant to the profitability of our, our business. And it's sitting on a dump, and we truck it in and, 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 and treat it. And the language that we were hearing was that we, we're destroying this resource. Now, um, you know, we hadn't even got going, but we're destroying a resource. And in reality, I, I have to say that we felt hopeless on many, many fronts. It was bizarre. It was a, it was a moment that, uh, you know, we, we thought, well, everything um, would be taken away from us. And this was only the beginning of the most fierce and intense spiritual battles I've ever had to face in business. And I wondered if it was normal. Is this the reality of how we walk out our calling uh, in the already, but not, not yet? And I have to say, I think so. And as Anne preached a couple of weeks ago, um, I asked God if he was telling me something, that my season was over, since everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And I didn't get a clear no, but what I did get was I got confirmation to keep going. Keep going. And we took the next step. And the reason, I guess, for that is that we don't, we don't see the whole picture. We just see in parts. And I think that's a protection for us, to just take that small next step. And when I look around at Anit and Gary and Louise and Paul and Ange, <laughs> I don't feel so sorry for myself. We're all in a war. And I dare say most of us here are fighting battles <clears throat> that come out of our positions as, as Christians. And these are spiritual attacks. And it's little surprise that as we advance God's kingdom on earth, <clears throat> Satan and the cohorts of principalities and powers over our territory will push back in a way and try and kill our spirits.
Because Satan has a claim to the world. He is the Lord of the dead who holds the power of death. And of course, Gary warned Paul and myself uh, before our induction as elders that we'd become targets because we'd made a clear statement to the unseen realm of whose, whose side we're really on. We're firmly in the crosshairs of the fallen gods or the powers and authorities. Um, they don't like the God of gods, our God, and they certainly don't like us. But we know that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the he heavenly realm. I've learned that the bigger the battle, uh, the bigger the breakthrough. Paul Tothill has shared this with me uh, on many occasions, and it's a truth. And I don't want to sound as if I'm giving more credit to Satan than, um, and the other powers and principalities around that are ruling over the earth because the work of the cross has destroyed the power and authority that they have over us. For he who is in you is greater than he in the world. But it's important to understand the reality of the spiritual realm as we seek to expand the kingdom of God on earth. The gods are real. Louise has already given us a, a lot of insights into the supernatural in our gospel series. And I highly recommend that uh, if you haven't, that you uh, read Michael Heiss's books on the subject because they they're absolutely fascinating and, and really enlightening. From the beginning, God wanted his human family to live with him in a perfect world, along with the family he already had in the unseen world, his heavenly host, as, it, as in heaven, so on earth. And that's God's goal. We think of heaven as a place that we'll live in with God and his angels, his divine family, and that's the way it was originally in, intended to be, and that's the way it's going to be. It's no coincidence that the Bible ends in Revelation 21 and 22 with heaven come back to earth in a new global Eden. God's business involves interaction with human history, and we are his images. Michael Heiser says the opposition of the powers of darkness, its failure, and its ultimate future success is what the Bible is all about. We can't appreciate the drama of the Bible story if we don't include all the actors, including the supernatural characters. Louise preached on how we carry out God's mandate, and there's no spiritual gift to take on the powers and principalities. Ours is to put on the full armor of God and spread the gospel, as Louise put it, as an antidote to the infected host. As we build the kingdom, we erode the power base of the enemy, and he knows it. And we're not promised an easy road. And as I've said, there's a fierce opposition to our mandate by the powers and principalities of darkness. And going back to Genesis 1, starting at verse 27, for us representing God means that Every job that honors him is a spiritual calling. Every legitimate task can be part of moving our will towards Eden and blessing fellow I images, or not. God doesn't view people in ministry as more holy or special because of their job descriptions. He cares about how each of us represents him where we are. We either stand against the darkness sharing the life God wants everyone to ultimately experience, or we don't. The opportunity doesn't need to be spectacular. It just needs to be taken. Attacks are part of our lives. We need to equip ourselves and handle them. And that's what community is meant for, because when we gather together in the name of Jesus, he's there in power and authority. And Matthew 18 tells us, again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. We need to understand that the victory is ours. 
whenever I face giants, I pray with a need, or the elders, or our kingdom business group, my business partner, life group, or whoever I am with at the time. Um, we've got a body of, of uh, brothers and sisters standing ar- around us for exactly that. And this is our unfair advantage. Three months ago, I visited a wall many times in the dark nights of my soul. (laughs) I was sure. I was sure that we were going to lose our business. But you walked alongside me and gave me words of wisdom, encouragement, and revelation. If it wasn't for the prayer, and most of them Zoom prayer meetings, that activated angels to go into the divine council to do our bidding and bring promises from the supernatural into the natural, I've got no doubt that we'd be shutting down right now. There was lots and lots of blood on on boardroom floors. Um, And the words that I got from, from you we're encouraging. But when you're in a battle with giants, it's very easy to lose hope and faith. And I must say, um, being given those kind of words, um, I should have been feeling like Superman. And actually, most of the, the time, I felt like Mighty Mouse. But God seemed to push a pause button and download it strategy um, to, uh, uh, on us. He gave us a kairos time and the wisdom to understand the times and our position in the supernatural first and then the natural. And we were able to um, continue resolving our commissioning and maintenance issues and keep a focus on our journey. Paul and I, Paul, my business partner, and I prayed through each and every decision we made and we sought God's face and we took our detractors head on every time they came up with lies and false accusations were fired at us. And our performance got worse. In July, we hit rock bottom. And I'm pleased that none of you could have seen me in the natural because it wasn't pretty. Ask your needs. There's some good things about COVID. You didn't have to look at this face. Fortunately, um, and... It's just amazing, um, Karen's word today. Fortunately, that was the valley God was leading us through. And um, our maintenance and commissioning issues were, in the meantime, being, being sorted out. And then we slowly started improving, and very quickly we moved to where we are now, far exceeding um, our business plan. Far exceeding our business plan. And the talk of taking away the resources shifted, at least for the time being. And Lord, (laughs) I humbly pray that this becomes your Kairos truth on our business. Our journey in business has been, I guess, the best experience I never want to get. But I know God's hand has been on me and been on our business. And uh, I've been pushed through a refining fire for whatever reason. So my prayer for for those of you going through this type of situation is one of Michael Heiser's quotes, uh, or one one thing that he shared in his book called Supernatural. It's Elisha's prayer in 2 Kings um, 6 verses 8 to 23. The prophet Elisha is in trouble again. An angry king sends his troops to surround his house, and when his servant panics, Elisha tells him, 
Don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And before the servant can object, Elisha prays, O oh Lord, please open up his eyes so that he may see. And God answers on the spot. So the Lord opened up the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. May God open up our eyes in the journeys that we call to, so that we'll never ever be able to think about our purpose in the same way again, because we're going to be the ones that rule against the angels in the new Eden. And that's, um, that, that is from 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3. We are in this world, we're not of the world. And we need to understand our roles um, from a spiritual perspective. The journey Jesus took was not an easy one, but he trusted his Father. And he pushed through even until death. He has given us hope that anchors our soul. And we see that in Hebrews 6 verse 17. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he'd never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Um, Jesus has already gone there for us. Uh, he has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And I know that God will never leave you or forsake you or for leave us or forsake us. Please, don't lose the hope that joins the love of God to your faith. 